Dr. Melissa Wilson with the University of Minnesota, an associate professor and extension specialist at the University of Minnesota. Fun fact, Melissa and I started at the University of Minnesota on the exact same day, just about five years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, she's been the lead of many of these efforts that you've already heard about, and, and I'm sure many, many more to come. Um, so look forward to her presentation. However, I do encourage you after her presentation, uh, we want some feedback from you as well. This database is something that I think affects all of us in some form or fashion or has potential to affect some of us or influence some of the things that we do. So uh, we'd like to hear from you on some on some questions that we have to move it forward. So, Melissa. All right. <clears throat> Let me know if you can't hear me, of course, online. Uh, so thank you so much to Nancy and as well as Bob for kind of lining up some of our thought process and displaying why we feel like we need a Menorah database. Nancy talked about how there's a lot of differences that have changed over the past 20 years. And we see that Menorah just isn't the same as it used to be. I guess it just happens with everything. Um, so we really wanted to build a Menorah database. It's one of the first things that I saw as a need is I get questions all the time like, what does a turkey tom bar and menorah typically look like these days? And, you know, we didn't have data to support any of anything that we would say. So we wanted to get this database going. And of course, we first looked at, you know, building one in Minnesota and then uh, this particular granting or uh, program, the Food and Agricultural Cyber Informatics Technology Initiative or the FACT program came up and we saw that as an opportunity to kind of build more of a national database. Um, so it was very fun trying to convince a bunch of strangers that they should totally give us a lot of money to build a manure database. So we had to make manure sexy, so to speak. So I'm going to give a brief overview of our project. We have to design and implement this database and then basically make this data publicly available. Oftentimes we think of a database as just being like a spreadsheet, at least me. This is how I think of a database. It's just a spreadsheet with some data in it. But that's actually, when you talk to a computer scientist, it's actually a lot more than that. So first, we'll talk about design and implement. Our basic goals are to combine manure analysis results um, from across the United States. As Nancy mentioned, some of these book values are based off of 20 samples from one study done in Iowa. And then that's how we are representing manure in the entire country. So I know that those samples we know were collected very well, all collected in the same time. When we're talking about manure samples from labs, we don't necessarily know all those details, but we are getting a lot more data. And that way we can see some of the trends and we can be able to kind of take out some of the outliers um, to be able to get a really good trend over and different in the different regions and across the US. So here we see these are the 2022 map participating labs across the United States. I didn't include the Canadian labs here, uh, but this gives you an idea of where these labs are in the United States. Of course, they're not partnering with us yet in this database, maybe someday, but it gives you an idea of like what labs we might be trying to and what regions we might be trying to reach out to. The other big thing is to make sure it's scalable and dynamic. Uh, we actually, we have some stakeholder groups that are part of this project. And one of them is actually uh, works with biogas. So we're seeing a lot of interest in this database for other aspects. So, you know, working with them, we might be able to find out what kind of characteristics they would want to know about manure to optimize biogas production. And if we can get labs starting to analyze those things, we'll be able to add those kinds of characteristics into this database. That's what we mean by scalable. And that it'll be able to accept new types of data um, in the future, more types of data, that sort of thing. So it is adjustable as we go and as we learn. Then, of course, dynamic as these labs, you know, one lab we worked with, I sent, I think sends us about 15,000 samples a year of data. So like, that's what we're talking about dynamic, like we can get really up to date data instead of waiting for one study to happen every couple of years when we basically can get funding that would look at different barn types and that sort of thing. Then, of course, we have to actually get this and provide a usable, you know, end user place that people can come and look up this data. So that's where we're going to make it publicly available. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to do, have people be able to look things up spatially, temporally, uh, by animal system, et cetera. And this just gives, this is some of the preliminary data um, that Nancy showed, just some of the ranges, gives you the medians as well as the 
middle 50% of all the samples. So the interquartile range and shows you that it is pretty variable across species, across liquids, across um, solids. So eventually people would be able to either kind of dig down further into this database, look at it regionally. That's kind of what we're hoping for. We also have four kind of activities going on within our larger framework for our project. The first is to evaluate the data, and that's what Nancy just showed you, some of the preliminary evaluations, not only of like what do the trends show us, but like what data are we getting? You wouldn't believe what kind of format the labs send data in. Some send us data in PPM or percent, some send us in pounds per ton, some send us in things I never even thought like I because I don't we don't irrigate in Minnesota so we didn't think about pounds per acre inch but you know other places get that data so just it's listed in all kinds of different formats um, so this gives us a baseline of what we have to work with next is engage we've really tried to include stakeholders primarily throughout the project so they helped us write the project but are also helping us inform what we need for the database and I'll talk about who some of those stakeholders are then of course we have to create this database, which I talked about earlier, and then ensure that it is fair. And these fair principles are really important in the kind of big data world. They have, the data has to be findable, accessible, interoperable between different systems that might wanna access our database and pull the data from it. And it has to be reusable. So that's where this kind of end user um, piece of software or way that you all access the database comes into play. It has to make sure that you all can actually use this data instead of the data just sitting behind a firewall. So our project team is uh, us in the College of Food, Agricultural and Natural Sciences at the University of Minnesota, as well as Extension. Erin and I both have Extension appointments. And that's what's kind of cool about this project is really driven by you know, stakeholder needs that we've seen as we've worked with you all, as we've worked with farmers, as we've, as we've worked with ag consultants. We also are working with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. They're the ones who run the Menor Analysis Proficiency Program, as well as the Supercomputing Institute. And yes, I actually had someone text me, I heard you got a grant to fill the supercomputer with crap. So that's kind of what we joke that we're doing. Um, and then kind of within our group, we also have all of our stakeholders that are really trying to help us inform what we're doing. So commercial manure laboratories, they've been um, critical in this. And luckily, I've been working with them to revise their recommended methods of manure analysis books. So I actually had all of these connections with the labs already, and it's been really great to work with them. We have livestock com commodity groups who are very interested in this data. They're looking at their sustainability metrics. They want to be able to see in certain regions what kind of manure is being produced. You know, do we have enough land? All of that sort of thing. Regulatory and agency staff are interested in this data. That's some of the questions I get from some of our regulatory staff are like, what does this manure look like these days? Um, so that way they can get an idea of, again, is there enough land to apply the manure? Researchers and engineers, it's really been fun working with researchers who do like the life, life cycle analyses because they want like really specific data that I had no idea. So it's been interesting ag professionals, as well as, again, those alternative energy groups. And we're kind of getting some people interested in this database who never thought would be interested in manure. So it's been fun learning about all of their needs. So progress so far, we were hoping to like actually have a database and a, you know, some way that you can access it by this point. But, you know, COVID <laughs> slowed things down. Turns out labs got really busy when they had fewer staff members to help them analyze stuff. So we've been a little bit slowed down, but we have made some progress. I'll show you our database schema or our relationship diagram that helps us kind of map out all the data that we'll need. We have compiled use cases. We'd love some comments on that from you all. And we've looked at our data use agreements as well, because it turns out lawyers like to get involved when you start sharing data that could be construed as private data. So we'll show you our progress on that. Here's our database schema. It's been really fun working with software developers because they think differently than we all do. So they wanted to put together a diagram of how all the data that we're going to collect relates to one another. So that way they can understand like, and start building some of these computational flows when we have people who want to access the database. How are they going to be able to sort the data, that sort of thing. But you had to make sure everything was related to one another within this database. Uh, so for instance, if you see we have samples here, this is all the information we're collecting about samples, lab ID, the 
sample identifier from the lab, the location, the manure type we're hoping to get, storage type. Uh, we should get collection date. We don't know if we'll get sampling procedure. Again, we're hoping that's the scalable part. We're hoping that that will be included at some point, whether it was agitated, whether bedding was included, all of those sorts of things. For the sampling ID, there can only be one sample ID associated with it. So that's why you see one hash here. Um, and then there could be potentially multiple species that are could be listed within the sample ID, but only one species actually can be listed. So it's, again, I don't necessarily follow all these flow diagrams, but it's trying to show that like there could be many or there could be one lab that has many samples and like one lab will have one lab ID, that sort of thing. So it's just trying to connect all of this data so that it's easier for them to construct the background uh, way that it'll be able to search things. So moving into how are our use cases, we kind of have three user groups that we're thinking about. The first is going to be the general public. Those who want just a quick snapshot, you know, that graph that I showed where it just had those general ranges of nutrients. That's kind of what we're picturing people in the general public might want to look at. Um, so this would be aggregated data with limited filtering capability. We'll see some like, you know, they should be able to pick up regions, maybe years, animal species, that sort of thing. But they're not necessarily going to get individual data points of manure samples. So we'll have a, a website that will be dedicated to this, the manure or db.umn.edu. The homepage will eventually be where you just go to kind of do a quick snapshot of what this data looks like. Our second user group will be the researchers who might want to look at this data, you know, see if there's correlations between nitrogen and phosphorus. Like, I don't know what all kinds of cool things y'all can think of, but we're imagining, I don't know if anyone's ever worked with this NAS quick stat tools. We're imagining it'll be something like that, where you have a set of lists where you can drop down and pick exactly what you're looking for. And then it'll allow you to download like a Excel file or CSV or something like that. Um, there will still have to be some aggregation there. We'll have some limits where, you know, if there's only one farm in the zip code or the region that you're looking in that could maybe identify that farm, then we wouldn't allow that data to be shown or be exported, if that makes sense. So there is, we are taking privacy concerns into consideration here. And then this is an, an interesting use case that the participating labs, we were kind of asking them like, why would you participate in this? Like, what, what are you getting out of it? And they actually want us to build a database or a kind of a view portal that they could go in and actually um, see just their lab's data, compare it to other labs in the region. They might not know what those labs are, but it'd be able to give them like a benchmarking capability to see, you know, if the manure that they're running in their region always tends to have more nitrogen than the other labs, but it's all from the same region, you know, does that make sense? So it kind of gives them the ability to benchmark where they are according to some of these other labs in the region. Uh, so in that case, it would probably require a login because it would be tied to their specific data and then compare it to the broader data. Um, so that's kind of our third user case scenario that we've been looking at. And then finally, the uh, legal aspects of it. Um, all of these labs, we've asked them to scrub personally identifiable information except for zip codes out. We don't want to know customer information um, we don't want them feeling like they're betraying their customers by sharing this data with them with us. So we're asking them to remove that. But there is still potentially um, zip codes. So we have to, um, we won't ever be able to show full zip codes, but we could show up to three digits of the, the first three digits of a zip code, for instance. So it's just stuff like that. Um, and then some of these data, these labs are private labs. Some of them are commercial or universities. And those labs have the expectation that they are sharing the data. So they actually have no problems you know, signing this. But some of the private labs are certainly concerned about um, the privacy issues. So we set up this agreement. It's basically saying, you know, your lab is being asked to submit this data. You agree that you have all the permissions to share the data, et cetera. I was really impressed. We got this down to one page. The lawyers got us to one page and then signatures on a second page. But like, I thought it was going to be this like eight page document that labs are never going to want to read and sign. Um, but so far, it's actually been a really nice process um, to use, basically just agreeing with us that you can share this data and you won't hold us liable if someone has a problem with it. So opportunities identified. I'm not going to say problems identified. We're going to be optimistic, say opportunities identified. Um, first one, terminology needs to be standardized. It turns out, and this is my, I also made this mistake, a lagoon in Minnesota is not actually a lagoon like it is in North Carolina. 
So those kinds of terminologies really need to be standardized. A farmer in Minnesota might say, I got this from my dairy lagoon, run a sample submission form. But we know that's not actually a lagoon. So it's like those kinds of things really need to be standardized. Uh, privacy needs. As we mentioned, we have some labs that are really concerned about if they submit this data and someone's able to pull a sample and it has a specific zip code listed on it, and that's the only farm in that zip code that they might be able to identify it. And then there's always concern that the regulators are going to know that I had high nitrogen in my manure and applied it. So there's all of these worries that we have to really consider. Um, also, the other <laughs> aspect of that is, so we've been learning that all of the labs are worried about giving too much data, but all of the like researchers want all of the data that they could possibly ever get about them in our sample. So we're really trying to balance these needs, these privacy needs with getting the spatial resolution that researchers want for life cycle analyses or nutrient budgets across the country, that sort of thing. And finally, this is one of our more interesting things that we learned. Manure sample forms, when a farmer or an ag consultant is submitting the manure, turns out they don't fill those out hardly. The labs sometimes are like, we get a bottle with a name written on it and says, analyze this. Like, so one of the aspects that we think that we can help, you know, being educators and extension folks is like, how can we promote filling out of this, these forms, the farmers or ag consultants or commercial manure haulers, however it is, um, to fill these out properly so that we're getting the data that we would like. Just to give you an example of some sample submission forms, this is one of the more complicated ones that we see. Um, you'll see we have the grower information, agent or advisor information, sample information, then it's like waste codes. That would be what kind of barn is it coming from and how was it stored? They have some codes that they want you to fill out. Sample description comments, application methods. Like you can see how it gets complicated and sometimes farmers don't necessarily want to fill this out. Um, she, I was talking to the manager and they were saying that basically they get like this information filled out and then like sample description, it says like hog. So you don't know what kind of barn it's coming from. It's just hog. But here's a simpler one from another lab. This one just has contact information, sample ID, manure type, swine, beef, poultry, other. So this is, you know, much simpler. You think it would be filled out more successfully. It's not. Apparently they get the same thing where like they barely write any information on it. So that's one of our biggest limitations is, again, you know, researchers want to know exactly what kind of hog production system it is, exactly where it was located in a watershed, and we're barely getting, you know, hog. So that's one of the things that we're hopefully um, like to discuss kind of in the future is what all, you, what all you think we can potentially do to solve this problem. So contact us here. This will be our website. It is made, but it's um, still behind our firewall because we don't have any data in it yet. We just got two labs fully legally signed on. So we'll be putting data in it very shortly and hopefully get that posted. My contact information, Twitter uh, contact as well. So I think with that, we should have time for questions. And then Aaron has some questions for you all after that. Yes. Why the Why the so generally when I showed those and I can put it back up. Oh yes, repeat the question. So the question was why the zip code? Uh, so basically with these submission forms, you're getting a zip code with the address. And that is one thing that they are filling out because they want you to send, they want you to send the bill to them or send the analysis back to them. So my question is like from the database So I would say that's not always the case in a lot of places. Like we found definitely that the hog manure in Iowa, a lot of times is deep barn, deep pit barns versus in North Carolina, it's all lagoons, that sort of thing. So we found that there are regional differences. And um, there's also just differences in how they feed in different regions too. Like I know here in the Midwest, there's a lot of, I don't know if this is the case on the East Coast, there's a lot of the DDG, DDGs, DDGs fed to animals and that like affects sulfur content and that sort of thing. Um, so we've been finding that if we can get it down to there and like some of our modelers for sustainability initiatives want to look at like watershed codes and that sort of thing. And so zip codes gets us uh, maybe as close as we can get just given the data that is filled out on these submission forms. So I, I, I understand like storage types would make a difference. Yeah, like the storage types would make a so for, mo for this database, we're interested in more of the, like as tested. So it'll be after the storage, after, 
handling all of that sort of thing right before land application. And that probably is coming. I'm a little bit biased in that regards because I deal with land application. So I see the importance of wanting to know what's going to be land applied. Um, and that's what we're testing in these situations. Yeah, so the um, comment was, could we create a standardized form and maybe the, they would get a discount if they filled out with the full information, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's definitely an option that we thought about. We know that some of the labs, especially like there's just so much, there's so many labs that we're working with and they all have their opinions of you know how to run their business. So we've kind of taken a bit of a hands-off approach. Like we don't want to change forms at this time. Um, you know, just trying to get them to work with us at all. Um, so yeah, but yeah, we've definitely thought about that. And um, we've been thinking about, you know, could this be a granting like multi-region, multi-state granting opportunity where we could set up something like that. I'm sure the labs would work with us if we wanted to set something up where they could get a discount if they fill out more information or something like that. Yeah, so the question was, since we will have addresses, could we go to the regulatory agencies and cross-reference stuff? In this case, we do not. We would have zip codes. We asked them to scrub the um, full address information for the privacy concerns. One of the interesting things about Minnesota and why um, it's good that we're hosting this through the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute is that we, our state actually passed laws that anything associated with data in Minnesota, um, including Min University of Minnesota and the Supercomputing Institute cannot be freedom of information acted. It's considered private data. Um, so that is one thing, even if we had addresses, like those could not be requested um, to be disclosed. But we figured we just kind of have both safe safety nets there where we just don't even have the data, but also it cannot be re requested. So full zip codes, even if we do have those, cannot be requested um, by other folks. Um, but that leads a good point. Um, and you being a regulatory person. So as in the state of Minnesota, do you, because I actually don't know this, so I'm learning too. Um, do you have certain size operations that have to send you manure analyses every year? Okay, so. Yeah, so in state of Minnesota, the question or the answer was they send raw data just of the manure samples, but not anything else about the manure samples. And then in Minnesota, it's all still paper based too. Like you don't have electronic system yet. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what it like it was like in all your other states if it's similar or not, but. That is one potential route of getting more data as well. I believe so. Um, that was part of the making it reusable and interoperable piece of it. So I think all of that we plan on having, you know, posted. I'm not the computer person, so I know kind of what an API is, but I'm assuming our experts in that regard will say yes. <laughs> Uh, my husband's in software design. So like sometimes some of the stuff filters through, I'm like, I feel like I've heard that, but I know it's like when other things can access it and kind of talk with it and stuff like that. So I believe all of that is like what the plan is. We're hoping to make this as open as possible. All right, Aaron's got some questions for us. Well, we do appreciate you sticking around because we do have a couple of questions and we'd appreciate your feedback. Uh, you know, the last couple of questions have focused on some of this data, data entry issue. And that was one of the last opportunities Melissa brought up. We are curious in all the different facets that you all work in. Do you have examples of where you've had successes or, or failures for that part, for that matter, in promoting data entry on, on these types of forms? And it doesn't necessarily have to be on manure sample forms, but, you know, are there some examples of promoting data, good data entry on, on customer forms that you can speak to? I think that the industry, a lot of them are going to barcoding and to QR codes. So they generally are going to be having the same type of samples all the time. So it makes it just really handy for everybody involved to just have a barcode and just run it in there. Other comments, feedback, Marguerite? 
I would add, uh, you know, as far as particularly on manure submissions, um, a typically the lab has filled out, you know, they're sending the producer the kit that they need to use for sampling and the lab has basic information filled out. But say I have a barn that's called Esperanza. I know what that barn is. So I'm just going to write the name Esperanza on it. And I don't need because, you know, those manure samples are for my purposes. Um, I'm not going to write the additional information on it because why bother? It, it just takes additional time and I know what barn that is. So I think that's going to be a, a big hurdle um, to overcome. And, and I'm thinking of that, you know, you'd almost need to financially, uh, you know, incentivize them to fill out that form completely, um, but also understand the data privacy concerns, even by zip code or by region. Uh, we definitely have some states where there is only one farm or one farm in that zip code, let alone one farm in that state. And so I think that becomes a very big concern from just that farm privacy standpoint. Other comment? Okay. Give me a second. Just working with a lot of the soil testing labs, I know they offer an incentive for using that QR code. They'll maybe take a dollar off the sampling. So I'm guessing a lot of these labs do soil sampling also. And so they're already set up to do that for their respective one. So I know it's, yeah, well, what we've seen with the grid or the precision soil testing is usually we would do a 40 acre field in one and now we're breaking it into 16 samples. So it's, it helps them process it and they can track it all the way through scanning that QR code and it, it provides them a lot of data quality, I guess. Other, other comments? I know we're getting we're getting feedback in Nebraska that a lot of the swine producers do want to have better book values and so um, you know a more up to date. And I think if it could be sold as if we can all work together on this and make this happen, that maybe that would help them have an incentive that they want to be a part of this because by state then they could say, well, let's get this right and try to get it up to date and and incentivize it, and maybe that would be a way. To give them because everybody wants to know, well, what am I going to get out of putting more work and more time and labor into it? And they can see, well, if we can get this together, that's going to help us so that, you know, we're more accurate on what we're telling people and how that fits together. Yeah, we've definitely seen some of that where I was worried that some of our ag consultants, et cetera, that are on our board would see this as not beneficial, but they were actually really into it because they want to make sure people are using accurate data. Um, if we've seen like phosphorus decreases in the manure, but if they're like regulatory agencies are saying, assuming that it's really high, but it's actually really low, like that can um, harm them. So I think people are interested in seeing these updated values. It is just getting them to understand how we do that process. The other thing that goes with along with that, you know, getting the updated book values is also understanding the amount of manure produced at the farm. Because at the end of the day, you know, when we're going to book values, we're trying usually looking at it and saying, okay, what's going on here? We're probably at a 30,000 foot level. What kind of P and P and K is this farm producing? So we can start to balance those nutrients. So, you know, whenever we look at book numbers, the book numbers are great, but we also somewhere need to understand the volume that's coming out with those within those systems so that we can, can do that because the book values in and of themselves, unless we know a volume to go along with it, doesn't really give us a whole lot of data and a whole lot of help. I think that's a good comment because yeah, when we're working on, especially building new barns and doing using the book values, and then you'd have the manure production and it said you were producing way more than you actually were because the water management equipment now is so much better, at least like in swine barns, for example, with like wet and dry feeders. So yeah, that's a very good example. So to, to somewhat build on this, um, this education piece ha has come forward, right? You know, how can we promote, how can we promote that value to filling in these forms in, in a more complete way? In your opinion, in your region and with the producers you work with, where do you feel the energy is better focused? Is it on a mass education effort of all farmers, or is that energy better focused on a couple of key consultants that perhaps are submitting many of the samples for a given state, a given region? Thoughts? I'd say for Ohio, you know, in general, most of the producers, the people on the livestock farm, they're not tracking all this stuff. There's, there's integrators, there's consultants, 
there's there's other folks within extension or the soil water conservation districts that would probably be key in, in making use of this data. I don't know if other people agree or disagree, but I'd say at least for Ohio, that'd be a fairly small number of people and a lot smaller than producers. Thank you. Any other perspectives anyone wants to share? I'm sorry I came in into this discussion late. I was actually on a, a conference call with Chesapeake Bay TMDL. I'm on the Ag Work Group. So uh, my name is Paul Bredwell. I work for the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association. And, and to kind of play off your comments on, on volume coming from farms, U.S. Poultry has tried to uh, help define more accurate numbers for the Chesapeake Bay. They have to try. They have to. They have to figure out what every pound of nitrogen and phosphorus is being generated within the bay. And and the numbers that they were using were book values, old book values. So the the industry uh, got involved and said, "Look, we, we know how many birds are out there in, on the in, in the in the universe. We know how you know how many are placed, how many are picked up. We know mortality. Um, so we got involved in that. And and again, to go back to your your comment about volume, we went out and we did a study on the farms, the turkey farms in Virginia, and we found that manure generation rates today compared to those in 2005 were anywhere from 44 to 70 cent percent less volume. That's a big number. And then when you start running out the, the calculation, how much nitrogen phosphorus reductions are there, that's drastic. So, you know, I think any time that you can go out and get data and hopefully funnel that back to maybe new book values, I think is very important. So for what that's worth. Any other perspectives to this question about, you know, where do we focus? Our last question then to, to end off this session is we see all of you as potential users as well of this information. And while as well, we all want to get as detailed of information as possible out of this database from a, from a research perspective in particular for you, for what you might potentially use this database for, what, what's a key differentiator that you want to use? We'll, we'll assume that you can look up by species, okay? Um, but what, let's say it's swine. How do you want to be able to differentiate the data that's in that database? Ideally, let's talk in an ideal world right now. What is a key differentiator for you? So I'd say a key characteristic for whether it be swine or poultry is the percent moisture content, because whenever you do these, look at the numbers, if it's 40 pounds per ton or a hundred pounds per ton, if it's 28% moisture versus 52% moisture, <clears throat> that concentration is really determined by the amount of water that's in there. And it's the same way when you look at your swine samples, your mm, phosphorus content is mostly related to the solids portion. And so if you're 98% moisture versus 92%, that's a huge difference. And so if you're going to do any kind of calculations or say, is my manure representative or similar to what the book value is, if you just simply look at the moisture content, it's going to tell you a lot. We have spent a lot of time talking about moisture content and, and how we even just differentiate. Do we put slurry or semi-solid or these differentiations? And I think we've, as long as we have the number in there, that's that's probably the, the primary thing. Thank you. Leslie? So being from Nebraska and the beef state, um, I would want to know for sure the like type of operation. If it's a cow-calf versus a feedlot, those are two incredibly different things. And the manure is going to be very different because one is going to be bedded and very likely the feedlot is not. Other examples? I think for me, just a uh, breakdown of the size of animals. So on the pig side, like nursery, sow farm, finisher, grower, that side, sort of thing. But more importantly, storage type. So is it a deep pit or is it a lagoon? And, and when I say lagoon, I'm not really sure it necessarily matters if it is a storage basin, an earthen storage basin or a true treatment lagoon, um, because frequently we treat those very similarly. So, I mean, similar to what we have laid out right now in Midwest Plan Service. So here's the size of the animals, and then this is the type of storage or facility that it is at. Samantha Cohen online also says handling system and region too. So any other comments? As you talk about the different things, maybe it's not so much that it's the feedlot versus the cow-calf as the bedding versus no bedding, because poultry would be the same way, broilers versus egg layers, the big difference is that bedding. I mean, even in layers, I think cage-free versus cage, um, we are getting reports that the cage-free has higher 
nitrogen levels. But I also say, I don't know on beef manure, is there a report for ash? So you know how much dirt is being scraped? That's typically given. Yeah. So that might be something that you want in the database for sure is percent ash. Yeah. So and I think that that adds a whole new element, right? Our, our manure analyses have a typical suite of, of um, sample analyses. There are some of these extra additions. The, the being a scalable um, scalable database, we have ability to add in these other factors. We might not have a ton of data coming in on some of them, but we have the space to make for them as they are. Maybe became more mainstream or, or maybe not, but there is space to add these different constituents. <laughs> in the ideal template, we do have ash. Yep. Good. Well, we appreciate everybody's participation and feedback and um, you know, Melissa, Nancy, myself, we will be here the rest of the conference. So please feel free to stop and, and ask questions, provide some more feedback one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's more than welcome to. Um, please help me thank our three speakers this, after, or this morning again. I think they all did a great job. <laughs>